Friends, we are all in search for something that can make life worthwhile, something that can make us whole. And that something that we are searching after is God. Not a God who is far away from us, but a God who is closer to us than our very breath. The discovery of this God in yourself is the greatest discovery you will ever make. You and I are searching for something, something that can make us whole and happy, something that will include our physical well-being and a real success in living. And if we were to ask ourselves just what is it that we want from life, I think our answer would be something like this. We want friends. We would like people to like us, and we wish to like others. We want to enter into the joy of living, and above everything else, we want to be happy. We want to eliminate fear from life and have an inward sense of security that makes us feel that all is well with us, not only in this world, but in another world to come. Every man's search really is after God because everyone is searching for something that will make him whole. And just as self-preservation is the first law of nature, everyone, whether or not he knows it, is in search for the assurance that he will live forever somewhere. But everyone doesn't quite realize that he is searching after God. And this is because we have separated religion from everyday life. We have tried to separate life from living and God from nature. So in some vague sort of way, we have come to feel that the kingdom of God is not really at hand, but rather that it is to transpire in an unknown future. But this was not the attitude that Jesus took, not when he proclaimed that the kingdom of God is at hand, and when he told us that if we would find God in ourselves and in each other and in nature, we should find happiness and wholeness. We should find what the human heart not only longs for but needs particularly in these times of stress and strain, when the question rises from countless thousands, what is it all about? Why this confusion and fear? Is there anything that can make us whole? I believe that out of this great confusion will come a great certainty. Out of this doubt will come a faith. It surely will, if enough people turn to that divine source from which everything springs. God really is our adventure, and divine power alone can save the world from its own folly. So as never before in human history, we do need God. We need to enter into a close communion with the living spirit, and feel the warm embrace of its presence round about us. We need to know that we are not pawns on a checkerboard of chance, that there is a real and a deep meaning to our existence, a meaning that includes this life and everything in it. And after this, a life to which we may look forward with happy anticipation. Nothing less than this could possibly give us happiness or peace. Perhaps at first, it may seem a little bit selfish when we say we want this and we want that and we want something else. Yet is it possible for us to think of anything as entirely separated from ourselves? We cannot think of life without thinking of its connection with us or its relationship to us. We cannot think of others without thinking of their relationship to us. The singer wishes to sing. The dancer wants to dance. The man engaged in business wishes to be a success. 
A man with a family wants to provide for them, for he wishes to be happy with them. Self-expression is not selfishness. Selfishness is seeking our individual good at the expense of others. Self-expression means that we live with others in happiness, giving to each the privilege of expressing every talent he possesses and rejoicing with him in his success. Though there is nothing wrong with self-expression, this thing called life has entered into each one of us in a unique and an individual way, animating everything we do and always urging us to do greater things as though there were no limit to our expansion. But we are so made that the greatest self-expression must include our relationship with others and our relationship to everything in life. This thing called life is God. And God means the invisible presence in the universe. God is the divine power animating everything. God is the law of good controlling everything. Solomon, who was one of the great wise men of all the ages, said, With all thy getting, get understanding. And Jesus, the most compassionate of all men, said, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. He said, I desire that my joy shall enter into you, that the peace which I have shall be your peace, that the certainty that is mine shall be to each of you as an enveloping blanket of security, feeling that all is well with you here. And hereafter, for he said, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Jesus also told us that if we find God in all things, we shall find him everywhere, for all these things are added when we see God in them. Jesus made heaven and earth meet, come together, did he not say that the kingdom of God is at hand? And he told us that everyone who comes into this kingdom and finds a right relationship with God will find love and friendship, success and happiness right here and now. Jesus never condemned the desire we have to live happily or to be successful. And so you see, the search for God is not a search for some abstract principle or some future state of being. Our search is to find something right where we are and to discover that something in each other and in nature. The psalmist said that the earth is filled with the glory of God. We all know that the great teaching of Mahatma Gandhi was not that we should renounce this world, but that we should find God in the world. Finding God, or this thing called life, in everything we do and in every person and everything we contact, this is our real search. And the interesting thing we discover when we read history is that the greatest examples of the human race have always been those who have found this something, something greater than they are, and yet something that seems to be a part of what they are, something that stands big and tall in people, something that can give us the assurance that all is well, but back of the fear and doubt, there is a great assurance that at the center of the storms of life, there is a place of peace that at the center of every person, if we look, we can find God. The pathway back to human freedom and human happiness will have to include the idea that God is not separate from his creation. He is part of it. God is our adventure. 
and the search is both individual and a collective or united one. But as always, we must start with the individual. That means you, and it means me. If our search for God happily results in our finding him, everyone around us will discover this. If our search for happiness makes us happy without robbing others, everyone we contact will be exposed to this happiness. It will be contagious. If our search is for love and we find it, we shall become lovable, and those around us will love us because we have first loved them. If our search for security finally leads us to the place where we are no longer afraid, everyone who contacts us will be helped because of our faith. They will be strengthened because of our strength. They will feel secure in our security. Have you and I really tried to find God in each other? I'm afraid not. Well, there is no use blaming ourselves. It does one no good to beat his breast and cry, how unworthy I am. This will merely add more confusion to an already confused mind. The searcher after God must learn to forgive himself and to forgive everyone else, to forget even his own weakness as he seeks strength. The searcher after peace must forget his confusion and he must meditate on peace. And as he does this, he will discover that the confusion leaves him. Searcher after God may be sure of this. He will have to find God in himself before he can hope to find God in others. This is why Jesus said that the blind cannot lead the blind. There has to be a seeing eye. When one of the disciples of John the Baptist asked him one day, what shall I do to avoid the wrath to come? John answered something after this manner. My friend, I have not come to tell you how to avoid some wrath that is to be visited on you in the future. I have come to tell you that the kingdom of God is at hand. This is the attitude we should take, that life holds nothing against us. It desires our good. It wants us to be happy and well and prosperous. Only it wants us to play the game of life the way it ought to be played, in unity and in cooperation with others. These are the only rules that life has laid down for us. It isn't demanded that we do something impossible. It hasn't told us that we have to understand something that perhaps only a few of the greatest intellects can understand. It hasn't told us that we have to become saints before we can enter into the kingdom of God. It has merely said this, here I am, accept me. I am truth, I am wisdom, I am love, I am peace, and I am eternal goodness. A child can understand this. And this is why Jesus exclaimed, Suffer the little ones to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Suppose then that you and I start all over, beginning right now, and let's see if we can't learn to forget all the heartache and sorrow and pain, all the fear, the frustration and uncertainty, and go back inside ourselves until we find that little child who isn't afraid because by some divine instinct within him, he knows that underneath are the everlasting arms. Are we afraid? Are we afraid of becoming that spontaneous child again, lest Someone think that we are foolish? Well, who is there among us who wouldn't be happy as a child again? Who is there among us who would not recapture the dream of his youth? For we are 
tired of building and spoiling and spoiling and building again and we long for the dear old river where we idled our youth away for a dreamer lives forever but a toiler dies in a day no if the greatest man who ever lived has told us that we must become as little children, we need not be afraid of being childlike. Remember this. Childlike does not mean being childish or silly or foolish. Childlike implies a sublime attitude a scientist must have as he stands in awe before the majesty and the might of nature. It is that childlike quality that a mathematician must have as he contemplates the infinity of numbers. It is that reaching out toward the essence of beauty which every artist feels when he captures the glory of a sunset or the soft, radiant pathway of the moon across the water. We need not be afraid of being childlike. Rather, we should fear not to be childlike, for only through an attitude of faith and trust can we ever hope to recapture our lost paradise. Yes, your search and mine is for God, God the great reality, God that divine good which alone can give us security that infinite and all-enveloping love that alone can give us confidence in life. And so let's try to find God in ourselves and in each other. And let's not be afraid to look for him in human events. Just as surely as we do this, we shall find him. Ask, and ye shall receive. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you.